we're very passionate about reuse and and the impact that it can have on our society. We're really excited to have artists uh, like these to join us and, and let us know about how meaningful it is to their process. Um, and so um, now, Lars, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more from you. Uh, I believe you have a presentation and, and I'd, I'd love for you to share that with our audience. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you for having me and for putting this together. The first thing that I would have to say about this is a bit of a disclaimer in that uh, when I set out to create this place, I didn't necessarily have in mind to create su sustainable, a sustainable structure. It, for me at that time, it was really more about, you know, a, a sustaining of my own livelihood, because I, at that time, you know, was work. I was living as an artist, and I was working for Socrates Sculpture Park, which is a not not for profit, and this all came about really just as a means to provide for myself and it was done just in with whatever materials were around and at the park we we put on a lot of exhibitions a lot of sculptures that ultimately were dismantled so i had access to a lot of the tools and a lot of the materials that were once sculptures in the park what I was provided with was this one shipping container and it served as a field office. So uh, perpendicular to that, you can see another container and that was a tool shed, essentially. You can see on the inside, it was really just uh, a pretty uh, crude field office. These containers are, they're 20 feet long, they're eight feet wide. This uh, was one of, the other many containers that we used, someone had outfitted it with these double doors. And you can see there's a uh, I-beam that was designed to swivel out. It rotated out through those double doors as a, a jib crane. So at, at one point, these two containers must have been configured uh, on top of one another so that the, the crane could be used to haul things up onto the second story. Here you can see how that jib crane had this swung inside and you can see above that circular skylight that was put in. I was using plywood on the walls there and some reclaimed flooring. It was insulated and that window, yeah, that wasn't existing. I put the window in as well. And, you know, these containers are are designed really to be stacked and they're meant to be picked up with an industrial forklift like this. It occurred to me that uh, this might be a way that I could provide a, a home for myself, a low cost living space. I had an, an outdoor kitchen on a you know, crude porch. And in the next slide, Oh, that's an image of the skylight. That was that was the entertainment of the house. You just look up at the trees and the and the leaves and the birds and whatnot. You can see the lovely bathroom situation that I created for my. That's a shower there on the left hand side. That's around the back side of the container, and this is a passive solar hot water system, which is a fancy way of saying it was a black hose that was coiled up and left on the roof. So you give that a few hours in the morning, and if you time it right, you can get a nice hot shower if you open the valve real light. And I figured, well, if I'm really gonna make this into a truly livable house, I have to have a proper bathroom and a little bit more space. So on the right-hand side, you see a container number three, which was appropriated for use, and I decided to go double wide on it. Once you set the two containers side by side, you can begin to cut the walls between the two. And this is a, an image of the divisions that were starting to go into place between uh, to divvy up that space. Right hand side, the first uh, beginnings of the stair treads, which were a staircase to lead to the second floor. There's the finished staircase, and that was accomplished by welded steel uh, supports to a, um, a vertical column. 
So you see the original field office on the right hand side and the threshold between the two containers and on the left, you see the new uh, double wide space. Much of this, mind you, is again, made up of stuff that was sort of lying around. This is the bathroom. You see the three treads above the toilet there and another three taking a dog leg turn up over the shower. So the, much of the challenge here was to use as efficiently as possible this very tiny space. See, there's a detail of the toilet now. See, this is one of the tricks uh, when you don't have proper uh, linkage into municipal systems. You can use uh, what you see here as an incinerator toilet. So that is a toilet that doesn't use water. It is an electrically powered incinerator of waste. So on the right hand side, you see the opposite view once you've reached the top of the stairs. So that is a very small kitchen. Uh, and then above, it's notable, you see a, a skylight. And in the, in the next slide, the living room eventually became so the bed was moved into another container took on a another hand-me-down uh and this was a real good one this came as a, a fully intact sculpture uh one of our artists jason tomei had built this wonderful greenhouse structure made to create a, an addition to the place dandy new solarium it filled out eventually with Lovely gatherings, party, all was well, that ends well. Uh, but then, and this is about seven years into my time at Socrates, and it, so uh, it was time to move on. Forklifts were brought out again, and the entire place was, was picked apart box by box in order to be moved, strapped down all the belongings. Imagine uh, taking your entire kitchen. And it was bound for Red Hook, a dry garden, uh, built it up, delineated garden beds and built up the rubble. And then uh, it was then filled out with greenery and mosses and plants uh, between all the, the, the bits of rubble. And in the last slide here, uh, you can see it in its current state, somewhat abbreviated. Uh, without the solarium, without the tool shed. And so now it just exists as a four unit container house. And that's where we are today. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Lars. So folks, uh, we're also tonight so enthusiastic to be joined by Michael Arad. Thank you, John. It's, uh, it's a pleasure being here and, uh, and helping to draw some attention to materials for the arts. It's such a great organization. I'm happy to be here. Um, Lars, I had a question for you about that window. You know, um, I was hanging art up here at our place recently and sort of laboring about, should it go here, should it go there? And I would never think about actually going out and buying a window and then trying to figure out exactly where on the wall to put the window. But it seems like when you're putting that window in, how, how do you pick, do you sort of sit in the room and Oh yeah, right about there. Let's put that. I try to live with the space. I mean, as as long as I can, and 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 prototype these sorts of decisions as much as I can. I mean, sometimes it's as simple as uh, before you commit to a position, just drilling a little hole in the wall and peering through it to see what the view offers. It's interesting that that sharp contrast between the outside, which has that very sort of, it is an industrial object, right? It's a shipping container. And then the, these touches, which completely transform it, like that round skylight, like the, the curtains, which are right behind you. Um, they sort of seem to challenge ideas of domesticity by kind of actually embracing some of them and putting them in a completely different context. Am I overanalyzing that, or do you see it that way too? Well, well, no. I mean, it was that's one of the the, the tricks of living in a metal box to try to make it a little warmer and more friendly to actually reside inside of. And I think the other big difference between working the way I did here and and the way that you perhaps do is that 
it's sort of subtractive, you know, when you start with a metal box, it's, uh, and you, and you had asked about the windows, you know, you start with a solid and then you, you create these piercings and these cuts and these alterations that only take away from it, essentially. Uh, and so, yeah, to, to put in skylights, windows and soft materials are all an en endeavor to, to soften it and make it more livable. Architects are often accused of creating sort of hard, unlivable environments, and uh, you almost set yourself up with a challenge of starting at that end of the spectrum and kind of sliding back in another direction. You know, um, when I was looking at that round skylight, I thought of a, a project that I had done, which other than geometry doesn't have that much in common with it, but it was that, um, that green roof that John was asking about earlier, which was uh, for the Fifth Street Farm, it was um, for uh, a New York City public school on Avenue B at Fifth Street, where my son was going to school. And uh, we wanted to grow vegetables up on that roof. And one idea we had was to actually take these round kiddie pools and just plop a hundred of them up on the roof and use that. Um, unfortunately, uh, working with the school construction authority and their very sort of strict standards, which are there for a reason, uh, we discovered we couldn't put that additional weight directly onto the roof slab. But that idea of sort of taking a, an object and, and just changing how you use it and how, and how we perceive of it would be great. But it started with, uh, with a plastic tub that was about four feet across. There's something that, you know, as an architect, you're always bound by longer timelines and having to make decisions well in advance. The, the idea that you can just go out, get something, put it together, uh, feels liberating. Yeah, so this, so what you've described here uh, in this in this garden, this was a this was essentially a retrofit of a, of a school. So this was working with only with what you could. And I guess you have that freedom uh, when you're building for yourself and when you're working as an artist. Um, um, so I'm somewhat envious of that freedom that that you have when it comes to approaching building something. I admire the profession of architecture very much and. Uh, I think that it's it must be very difficult to have to comply with so much of the dynamics that are that are at play there. I, I've loved the process and and thought at, at one time that it might be fun to try to do more architectural projects, but the freedom with which I was able to build this out and continue to tinker around with it. it uh, but it's it's cool that you're able to to make a project like this garden happen. Thanks. So, tell me, what are do you see connections between the work on your house and your artistic projects, the sculptures? Not not entirely. No, sculptures are, of course, not really at all functional. Um, whereas a house or architecture of any kind really is is purely a, a machine for for living and so a lot of the, the things that dictate decisions in making are just not at all at play in making a work of art you know these are just static objects very cool to see these and you build these yourselves right so um i would see some overlap in that sort of that skill set right of being able to build your home and to build these. And they both have a sense of uh, inviting you in uh, to inhabit these spaces. The subject matter, it can relate to buildings and then ordinary things in the world. And certainly like the way, the how that they come into being, it, the sculpture came first and it really, you know, the training and how to build these things certainly came in handy when it came time to applying that to making a house. This house is really just a bigger version of what I do in the studio. But yeah, and some of these are meant to be seen as spaces. They play with the idea of, of what is an icon, right? I mean, they're, they're recognizable and then they're distorted, which in a strange way is the opposite of what the house is, right? It is not recognizably a house in any way, but it is. That's true. There seems to be um, you know, seriousness and humor simultaneously at least. And, uh, and earlier that um, the garbage bags that were shown that are sort of 
sitting there, I guess they're not really sitting because they're not a person, but they, they, they feel like a body that's slumped in a corner. They were meant to sort of resemble human forms in, in some way. They were meant to, to reference classical, the classical sculptor's challenge of rendering uh, drapery. If Bernini had to uh, do the yeah. fold on the trash bag. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And this was also a reference that sort of in terms of uh, reuse and waste and whatnot. I have a question for both of you, actually, Michael and Lars, you know, materials for the arts all day long, trying to talk to people about reuse. Could you talk about why? Like, why is that something you choose to do? It was really out of necessity. You know, I fully believe in the importance of material reuse. I, I think it's absurd how disposable a lot of our products and even our buildings have become. It sounds like a little bit of necessity is the mother of invention and then uh, an acquired taste comes with it. Uh, so, I mean, for example, for you, the Green Roof Project, you know, why, why do something like that? Because it should be done for starters. It seems like such an obvious uh, thing to do. Uh, the student body, the teachers, the parents were all very excited and eager to do and have been exploring for years, but it kept hitting the hurdles of how do you technically pull this off? And um, which is why the initial thought of how do we make it quick, easy, and instant was what drove me is to try and find a, an immediate, simple solution to it. And obviously, it's not a sustainable model for feeding kids day in, day out, but it's a great way to, it's a great educational tool, it's a great recreational tool, and it's environmentally the right thing to do uh, for a variety of reasons. What I like about your house is how it, it is a reflection of you in many ways. There, um, I've seen other container houses, and they, and they, they lack that individuality, and I think that slow process of, of addition and uh, building it up over time has resulted in something that's very unique and not, does, it does not feel planned in the way that an architect would approach it from the beginning and try to have the whole thing sort of, you know, sorry, it was almost like a tabula rasa. I think you have given the process opportunity to inform it in yourself. Yeah, like we were saying before, it, I think, it was such a different process in that, you know, it just sort of grows and it, it's something and then subtractively you create divisions within the space and, and um, openings and windows and doorways and, and that sort of subtractive approach is what made it different. And maybe that's was part of the process, you know, I, maybe, it, it's not like a start with a piece of paper or on a computer kind of process. I, honestly, I see such inspiration for me just in these possibilities, um, you know, seeing this possibilities of, of looking at spaces in new ways, retrofitting spaces, using these materials and kind of a peek um, into possibilities to come. And, and you know, Lars, I'm, I'm completely fired up about you know, a lot of what you were describing about, you know, kind of movements and using materials and responding materials and design and, and feeling that space, I, it's, it's very inspiring. Um, we at for the Arts, you know, get so many materials and we're, we, we see them as, as almost kind of inspiration machines to give, give people ideas. Um, and, and we're just enthusiastic to be able to, to chat with folks like yourselves. Um, and um, so, you know, we're just excited to see w w what's to come. Um, folks are gonna be able to, to check this video on, online where we recorded this, um, but I think uh, I just wanted to make sure, sure everyone gets a chance to see uh, the current exhibit that we have at Materials for the Arts right now, Contemporary Reuse 2020. But before we leave, I just wanna thank both of you. Thank you, Michael Arad, and thank you, Lars Fisk. Uh, we really appreciate your work. We're inspired and uh, looking forward to, to talking in the future.